<laughs> and then you can never just don't pull an Elon Musk. And you'll be all right. Yeah, exactly. No, no Dogecoin comment. No, no, that's not exactly. <laughs> all right. Yeah. I love it. Hey, I am. Um, so Phil Shoemaker, Home Point, welcome to the Walk Podcast. Thanks for coming on, man. I know we've talked about doing this for a little while. It, we, we used to work together a lot, and it's good. It's good to see your face. I'm proud of what you've accomplished, and I'm I'm looking forward to kind of getting caught up on it. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate that, and looking looking forward to to our chat. So, where where geographically, where are you? I can see the sky outside, but where are you? I'm up in Ann Arbor now. You That's are. Yeah, I, I I just I have a hard time not not jumping, you know, all the way in. So when I when I joined Home Point, I I uh, I moved up here from Dallas. So how was that for the family making the move? How long had you been in Dallas? Oh, uh, man, I was in Dallas like eleven years. Wow, yeah. so it was uh, you know, it's funny. It was really tough for them initially, but then we got up here and they like Ann Arbor is a cool place because it's uh it's small, but it kind of feels, it has that city vibe, you know, and right. uh, the kids can kind of go anywhere they want. It feels really safe, you know, I and mean, not, not that Dallas isn't, but all the traffic and just the sheer scale of it, it's, you know, you have a lot more freedom, I think, as a kid up here. And so they, they like it. I, I, I it took me a little bit to get over that. I mean, Dallas is a cool place, you know, so it's a, it's just, there's so much to do there and the food's great and all. And the, the well, you knew, you knew the spots. I mean, that was your backyard. Yeah, that's right. I got you, as you know, I got plugged in pretty well there, mm -hmm. but um, no, we're, we're liking it. Yeah. We, Ann Arbor's a good place. It's, I will say the weather right now, you can't beat it. I mean, it's like, you know, 70 degrees and, you know, sunny is green and it's just beautiful. It's there's awesome. no, um, there's no summertime tornadoes and microbursts no. in Ann Arbor like there is in Dallas, right? No, no. I mean, you get like some sketchy weather here and there, but it's it's pretty, it's pretty cold. It's just the winters, and it, and the winters, it's not even you know, it's cold. It's not it's not really that or the snow. It's just it's really gray. And it's yeah. My arc things, we just we're gonna just kind of get get out for a couple of weeks every <laughs> every winter. And I think that that makes it okay. You know, make your trip somewhere where it's sunny, or get you one of those UV lights for your uh for your desk. Plus, awesome. we're all, I think we've all been trained to take a bunch of vitamin D now since right. the, uh, <laughs> since the lots pandemic. Of, lots of vitamin D, man. That's the, that's the key. Or so, I, or so I'm told. So, <laughs> did, you, did you make the move geographically pre pandemic or during the pandemic? How was that from a timing perspective? Yeah. So, we actually moved up here, man. What was it? It was, uh, it, it was the middle of 19. And then just as we were kind of getting seated, you know, the, the you know, COVID hit. Or February ish. And so that did kind of suck. You know, I bet that was really hard. I mean, you can't get out and meet your neighbors. No, yeah. And we're still kind of dealing with that a little bit. Um, and it's actually harder on our kids. You know, it's just really hard to I bet plugged in when they haven't really met anyone and they're doing school remote. That was yep. that was difficult, but you know, things sort of I mean, I guess they're kind of calming down. It seems like we're, you know maybe we're just getting used to it that could be it too <laughs> it's like the well, that's kind of the scary part I, I worry that we are kind of getting used to it how, I, remind me how old your kids are my son's 15 my daughter's 12 yeah oh yeah so that's i mean they're plenty old to feel the effects yeah. of that of that change yeah it, it was tough there for a while but they've they've gotten back to you know for a while their you know kids didn't feel comfortable or parents didn't feel doing like play and stuff like that and they've right you know, we, we've, you know, my daughter's got some good friends. My son's got, you know, some good. So they're, they're starting to get plugged in, which is helping a lot, but it was, it was tough there early on, you know, and then I was working crazy hours and, you know, it was, it was tough. <laughs> and not, not home to help support managing everybody's emotions while they're going through the move and <laughs> Bill's hiding behind his office door. I can picture it. Yeah, I, can fix it. I got in trouble a couple of times, but actually that's the, one of the benefits of COVID is like it, it really, um, you know, and I did, I did a lot of traveling the last few weeks and I felt it. It's like, I don't, I don't like the traveling. Man. I'm, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it a little more strategically. It's really yeah. nice, being, you know, and being a part of your, your family and like being, it's just that, that, that part of it was good for me. You know, it did, did kind of show me maybe what I, what I've been missing. It's probably really good for you. Did you got, you know, a lot of folks that we work with, 
took that opportunity to do like a long-term rental somewhere super sunny, like in Florida or California. Did you guys do anything like that? Yeah. So we actually dig, we have, you know, my, um, my family's down in Tucson, Arizona. My wife mm -hmm. is, my wife's family's in Phoenix. So we actually, uh, rented an RV and drove across the country. And then, and then, uh, you know, we turned down the RV. We rent, stayed in hotels and the B and B for about a month in Arizona. And okay. Rent an RV. Hit some. Actually, hit some friends in Dallas on the way back. I'm not there, and then and then came back. It was fun, but it's also tough to be away from your house for that long. You know? Yeah, yeah, I bet. I bet yeah. you don't have any animals, do you? No, we have. Well, we have a dog. Yeah, Took the was, dog in the RV. Yeah, he was like yeah, that. It, works, I guess. It was a party, man. It. it I think. Uh, the kids loved it on the way out coming back was kind of a that was tough because everyone just wanted to get back you know they were so, tired and beat and kind of over it yeah three days yeah. out there were you able to get a lot of work done in the rv no <laughs> <laughs> i did calls i mainly uh mainly drove you know you weren't That's, sitting in the back your wife was was at the wheel yeah. that wasn't happening that was part of the deal i grew up with that's what my family did for vacation we had an rv and it's like oh, that's great used to that but uh no man it was it was uh it was kind of nice you know but we didn't miss the the normal you know we didn't take our first vacation really until uh it was like i think last month we went to mm -hmm. Florida, just for a week you know just to get go somewhere sit on a beach kind of thing it was nice and just turn it off for a minute yeah. it, it, this is, it, here's a you mentioned sit on the beach you know, I have a memory of a story you told me about a beach that you sat on once. <laughs> the finger story, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to tell that story? <laughs> you want me to tell a story here? Sure. Okay. This is hey, on the walk, we don't we don't talk about things like conservative conservatorship and you know what Fannie and Freddie are doing. We just get to know each other, man. <laughs> hey man, I'd I'd much prefer this. Uh well, actually, not this story. Yeah, I was uh this is a good story though. Yeah. It was actually the last time I was in Mexico. I went down. This is maybe, um, I think it was 2014. So it was a while. It was like seven years. And uh, we rented a, with a, some, a, a couple, you know, some friends that we had. So it was like four or five couples, I think, rented this house on a beach thing, this really remote town. It's called Sayulita. Is so so we, we just went to Sayulita. Drew and Kirk and, and myself, yeah. the three of us and the, oh, really? the, 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 the wives and girlfriends, we went, we went to Sayulita. So I, now I know the spot. You do. So, so on that, in the center of town there on the beach, there's that guy that rents those chairs. Mm -hmm. right? from, that's where we, we went into town multiple times. We didn't stay right in town, but we went in three or four times to eat and hang yeah. out and stuff. It's a cool spot. And so Super you guys, cool spot. You guys, yep. you go there to learn to surf, right? So you guys are big surfers. Yep. And that, uh, yeah. And, which I tried once. I'm not, you know, I think I'm too old for that. But um, No, you're not. Stop it. <laughs> it was a uh, second to last day. And uh, we were just it's like 10 o'clock in the morning, went down the beach, rented these chairs. And uh, I'm going to sit down and it's one of those folding chairs. And I, I go to pull a chair up. And when I did that, it unlatched the back just a little bit such that when my weight hit it, it came unlatched and it was like a pair of wooden shears and it cut off about a half inch of my finger. <laughs> Which of course like, yeah, I fall down and my wife and my best friends there are laughing at me and then I stand up and you know, I get this, you know, finger with blood just kind of squirting. Oh my out. gosh. And you're on the beach in Salida. It was horrible. Man. And uh, it, took, it took me like two hours to get to a, a doctor. You know, it was like some, I don't know, hole in the wall place, and no one spoke English. Luckily, my friend's wife spoke spoke Spanish, <laughs> and so they uh, they like the hardest part was they had to they had to numb it to clean it, and I don't, it's really painful. So they have to numb you starting your wrist, and so they kind of work. Oh yeah, their, right. They hit, they hit the nerve until they get to the top. So I numb it, and the guy cleans it up. He's like, "Come back in the morning." So my flight out was the next day, next afternoon. He's like, "Come back, and I'll check it out," you know, and. So we, you know, of course they give me some prescription to some medicine. It turns out it's like some crazy high dose of Advil that's illegal in the U S cause it like, nice. just, yeah. So it didn't work at all, but I show up in the <laughs> and the guy's like unwraps it and he's looking at it and he's like, Oh no, oh, which is not what you want to hear with, with a, you know, a in Mexico in a foreign country when, yeah. you know, you're still two hours away <laughs> from the airport before you can even begin to get back home. That's right. So he's like, 
And so she's like, she's like interpreting what he's saying. He's like, there's this artery. I need to suture it up. I'm like, you know, oh man. So you had to, they had to numb it up again. Like it was, it was really painful. And then they, they like do the suture in this, this end of my severed finger. And which of course I'd come to find out they did not have to do. And so I, oh, I no. and, and uh, get into a, a plastic surgeon and they, they do this surgery called, it's called a skin flap where they actually take, you know, I mean, they take like a portion of your finger down here and they, they moved it up to the top and the artery and the nerve and everything. And they kind of remade the, the tip of my finger, but it, it was actually kind of funny the contrast of the, of the uh, medical system, you know, it's like at the end, I can't remember what it was, but I think it was like, it was like $500 or something, you know, when we're going to check out and, and total. Everyone, 500 bucks total. Yeah, everyone's reaching in their pockets and we're pulling out pesos and dollars. And I think we got to like, cause they didn't take credit cards, cash. They get to like 450 and the guy's like, good enough. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so, and then of course we get home and, you know, I get going to the surgeon and they, they put me out and I'm out for a few hours. They do the surgery and wake up and, you know, it's, and then you know, a couple, couple weeks later, I get a bill for like 20 grand. <laughs> from your, from your guy. Yeah. It was like the, you know, insurance covered part of it. And then there was a, you know, the oh, man, that, yeah, that, 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 that's crazy. Did what happened to that chair? Did you save it and hang it up in your office? Oh, okay. like the My wife went back to actually look for the thing and it's a good thing she didn't find it. Like, the, cause apparently that's where people go wrong is they try is to, to try it. to attach it. Yeah. And it's, it's uh. usually, it doesn't end well, but couldn't find it. And, but the guy had like taken the, you know, brushed off the chair and already rented it to another, another group of people. <laughs> so, Hopefully somebody didn't mistake it for like a piece of a churro or no, something. Man, it was like probably a, you know, street treat for a. <laughs> Is that bad? Did I go too far? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not sure why you think it was a churro. I don't know. I, I remember, well, you know, when I, Phil remembers losing a finger yeah. in Sayulita. I remember the churro guy in Sayulita. Oh, yeah, it was, oh, oh, I remember that the car, he had the blowtorch. On, that, on the street with the, yeah. it, oh, it was insane. <laughs> So, you, you know, us gringos, you think you've had a churro from Taco Bell or whatever, and that's a churro. And then you go to Sayulita and get yeah. the guy on the street. You're like, I've never tasted anything like that. That's a churro. Those are good. I re we did that a couple of nights. We walk in and get the, it's a cool little town, you know, you're really. It's a, su it, it's a super cool. So what did that experience teach you that made you better at what you do for a living? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man uh it's emergency management man like is, isn't that when mortgage banking is pretty close to emergency management sometimes yeah no it is well i did i did learn this is kind of not directly gonna answer your question but it's funny when I, was, I remember sitting there thinking i can't be the only like idiot that it's cut off his you know finger or body part with a a beast chair i remember googling it and uh <laughs> it was in seven thousand people a year cut off a portion of their body with a full with a table. beach chair well a folding table or chair in the u.s in the u.s and and so i will say since then i feel like i'm really good at identifying things that could chop off a body part yeah i, I bet you are you're probably one of the only people i know that actually googled how many people have lost a piece of an appendage <laughs> with a folding chair or a folding piece of furniture of any kind you you know have you thought about starting you know you see these commercials for facebook groups have you thought about starting a facebook group <laughs> for like survivors of uh, <laughs> finger from beach chair no to answer your question i don't know if it's i i have gotten a lot more relate laid back you know less less uh I take myself uh, a lot, you know, a little, a little less serious these days. And so I don't know if that's just old age kicking in or just experiences like that. You know, it's like, I think the older you get, life just sort of humbles you out. And sometimes maybe cutting off half inch of your finger. Is this what it takes? Look, man, I need. I do want to say that Ikea has taken a stand. <laughs> Whoa, look at that. See? It's real. And that was it. It was a very similar beach chair to that. That's exactly right. And so the back of it, if it comes unlatched, it's like in your fingers in the middle of that, that little, uh, yeah, exactly. You're, you're, it's like a pair of wooden shears, man. Good luck. Thomas, that, that, that's impressive. For those that are listening on Spotify or whatever, we, Thomas just was able to pull up a, an, an advertisement for a beach chair recall. I think Phil Shoemaker is one of the is listed on the complaint maybe somewhere yeah. 
No kidding, man. Jeez. So for those for the for the broker partners that get to meet you now that you're traveling again, this this is a nice icebreaker if they see this first and they haven't met you in person yet. Yeah, yeah, I've used that a couple times. What's uh, what's really fun is freaking out the pictures. I got some good pictures of it, but that's not. You never fun. showed us the pic. You might have shown my partner Drew the pictures. I remember we had dinner years ago, so one of your favorite places and. <laughs> the woodlands or somewhere near near dallas and um i remember that story and, and it it made me laugh out loud i still think about that whenever i'm unfolding a beach chair i'm very careful <laughs> See, because I'm of phil shoemaker it. i'm paying it forward hopefully you, i've saved a finger or two with my stories let me tell you though if it takes losing a portion of your finger to calm yourself down i'm not sure i'm going to be able to sign up for that <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it just like puts things in perspective, right? It's like, I think it's really easy to your point, you know, especially in, in mortgage, it's really easy to get spun up on things, but man, it's like, you got to take what you do seriously. And I take what I do very seriously, but I also leave it at the door now, you know, when I get home, I feel like. Now, good, good, good for you. You've always had a really good, and, and you know, I can say this because I, I'm lucky enough and fortunate enough to get to meet so many leaders in this particular industry, and then, you know, serve on other groups or nonprofits where I get to meet leaders in other industries. And um, you're a really healthy mix of someone who has a, um, an analyst brain and, and someone, though, that, that is, is very relational in the way that you communicate. And, and I don't know if you know that that's unique, but, but it, it is pretty unique. How, remind me, you you didn't go to college. I mean, you weren't a finance guy in college, right? Weren't you an engineer or a I sort of? Part of it is I I uh, like I mean I guess like a lot of people I just sort of happened into mortgage. I, I was, my degrees in electrical engineering mm -hmm. and I actually um, got into mortgage while I was getting my degree. I met I met the group that was starting First Magnus and okay. so I on the very ground floor and and it was a, it was actually really it was a really cool group and it was like is the time in mortgage where you could take a little more risk on people i think you know right. you, <laughs> a lot of that was <laughs> bad because of clearly what happened in 2007 but um, through through that experience i got the ability to do do some big things at a young age which um you know which was uh, I, it was bad for me because there was a time period where i was probably a bit of an ass I was a little arrogant and thought my uh, you know, thought I was, I was the thing. And, um, uh, but it was good because it, it, it really did give me exposure to things that people don't normally get at that young age. But I got on the tech side, I built, I built first Magnus's LOS. And then uh, that ended up taking me because I got, somehow I got involved. I think because I was the young smart guy that built this system, like I do a lot of the recruiting stuff. I do a mm -hmm. lot of, you know, I got heavy into process and, and, and I just over time started gravitating more and more towards the business side. I think part of it is because, you know, I, I do a lot of tech people don't like to interact with people. And somehow I didn't, you know, I got that, like that side of it as well. Like I right. really enjoy the people side of it. Um, but I, I do, I, you know, I think just like anyone in life, I mean, you're kind of a product of, you're a combination of, of, of who you are, you know, but you're also a product of your environment. And I was sure lucky in some instances and I had some really really awesome people that took interest in me and mentored me and and you know I got exposed to things that maybe don't normally get exposed to so I don't know how I got here but I'm okay I'm glad well, I'm but here. that that isn't that's kind of what makes this industry a little special though I mean there's people within the industry that are actually using their degree or when they were in high school or college said I know what I want to do. And they yeah. do that within the industry. Yeah. But, but most, most leaders in the industry have similar stories, yeah. whether it's a top producing originator or a really successful broker or somebody running a mortgage company. You know, I don't know. I don't know Willie Newman's story from scratch. Yeah. And he, he's a hall of famer in this industry for sure. He's also someone, you know, I'm, I'm as I'm listening to you speak, you mentioned mentors. So, you know, you know, we, I know Joe Anderson, obviously yeah. Joe Anderson, I think was someone that you would put on that list as a, as a mentor, certainly Willie um, Newman over the last several years for you as well. But those are also both people that have that in common with you, I think, which is their, their brain is very much an engineering type brain, but they yeah. have the ability to sit down with a group of people 
and and build relationships and build trust. Yeah, I think that's that's was well, a couple things in that. So one, I think mortgage is a very unique industry because it is so heavy relationship centric and people centric, but it's also very complicated, right? And if you look at the the best mortgage companies out there, they're run. Um, by people that have a very and, and also with a mindset that's very data centric right and 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 uh, uh, the other thing about it is the industry it it also breeds I think people that get really comfortable with change like that's one thing I'm, I'm starting to appreciate more and more the older I get is mo- most of the time people hold themselves back right so mm-hmm. they're your, your, your sheer nature, you know, human nature is people don't like change. Like you, you actually subconsciously will resist it. You develop these habits, you know, that kind of put you down a path and, and your subconscious reinforces and, and to some extent wants you to stay there. You know, whereas if, if you, I think if you look at all the good leaders I've worked for, you know, and what I try to to, to constantly live by is feel get get comfortable with change you know because it's kind of like working a muscle man it's like when you when you feel something that makes you uncomfortable or you feel that pain it's it's actually you changing it's you being better it's 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 you moving forward right and and the other thing i'd say too is, is um you know the common theme just since we're on the leadership topic is yeah i mean joe still to this day one of my favorite people willie very similar to joe uh another one was the ceo of first magnus joggy uh great guy they're they're all people that that really believed in people and like mm-hmm. making out making other people successful and putting other people first and, and culture w- was always a big thing and 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 I've just, I, I believe that that's, that's actually one of the distinguishing factors for me in, in what I think will, what distinguishes home point and what will co- continue to, to cause other companies to win over other companies is, you know, oftentimes in this industry, and I, I would say even corporate America in general, there's too much bias towards the financial side, right? If you look at the average tenure of companies now, it's like it's like some crazy low note. It's like ten years. Like on mm-hmm. average, companies typically last ten years. Whereas if you go back, you know, 30, 40 years, it was like fifty or sixty years is the average lifespan of a company. And 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 I think the reason for that is that this hyper focus on like driving results quarter after quarter after quarter creates a very short term mindset. You know, so I, I think that, that to me, my personal belief and what I try to live by and what I think the key to success is in leadership and business is think long term and never make it about you, you know, and, and be comfortable with change because the minute you get stuck on your current course, you're done, man. Because like what worked yesterday isn't what what's going to work tomorrow, <laughs> especially in mortgage, man, because it changes fast as I think you've, right. you've seen over the years, Eric. It's it's, there's a lot going on. No, for sure. That was great. There's a lot to unpack there. I'm, I'm curious while it's fresh in my brain, um, you now being with a company that has gone public, yeah. is it hard to then reconcile the quarter to quarter piece? Because that really is what public companies are yeah. doing, right? So, so and, and I, I'm sure you're still doing it, of course, in, in to, to create the value necessary for your shareholders. But I think you're also talking about how that comes out in a leadership style, not just the fact that you might be doing it on paper, but how is that perceived by those that are counting on you to lead the organi- organization or create value for them individually? Well, it's kind of both, right? Because I think oftentimes companies get so fixated on you know the messaging around one particular quarter that they lose sight of the longer picture and so i will say this i and that's where i think leadership really matters you need and it starts at the top it starts with you know willie as an example like you need you need a ceo and that's one of the reasons why i'm here is you know i absolutely love working for willie like he's he thinks long term he has vision right he's not making decisions based on short-term things to hit a quarterly goal right um not that that's not important. I will say that, you know, I think I'm, I've been lucky in that, you know, what I've found with this whole experience of being public is it's not, the pressures are not that from a financial standpoint, they're not a lot different than being owned by private equity. Mm-hmm. They, they, well, what's probably been most surprising to me is that 
I thought that was the biggest risk is that somehow the the pressures would change and it would it would risk our culture and in 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 you know cause maybe a or create risk around short term thinking versus long term thinking. It's, it hasn't happened at all. The, the 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 biggest surprise is it's really more about communication. Like what I think is most challenging is you become hypersensitive around what you can say and when. And, and we used to be a company, and we, we still are, but pre, you know, going public, we were very transparent with our, all of our constituents and our associates. We were very transparent around our performance, what was going on in the industry, what was working, what, what wasn't. And now, as, as you know, you have to be, you can't say that, like to just, sure. like you, <laughs> you have to be like somewhat guarded. And so it does, it does kind of change like how you communicate internally as a company. And, and we've had to sort of adjust to that in, in the way we've kind of come up with it is rather than being so transparent, you have to kind of do it through high level metrics where we're trying to align teams of people around, hey, here's the common goal we have in terms of, you know, from a metric standpoint, and then you motivate people that way. And so it's just a, just a shift, you know, in, in, sure from a communication standpoint it's probably been the biggest thing i've seen yeah 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 um i think the people like you and and willie are probably uniquely designed to be able to handle that kind of shift you know you were also talking about um how dynamic this industry is that it's constantly changing what can you point to parts of your career maybe early on where you identified change as a negative or a failure and now maybe you don't <laughs> i mean because I, I, you, as close as you work with people that are commissioned salespeople, right where one loan could be the end of the world I, i'm curious you're like does anything any story stand out for you or moments in your career yeah oh my god yeah um well the first was going through the financial crisis is that that kind of you know that that really turned everything upside down um but a after that and so you know that was when first magnus folded you know, we started another company uh stonewater and then subsequently sold that to lone star funds and that's what became caliber home loans it's kind of well ba back up for just a second though the, the the when that happened like the day that so i remember i was at i was actually on vacation at the beach yeah. and we we had just, we had been doing work with the retail side of First Magnus. I had actually gone out to Tucson, met with um, Randy, Randy uh, it doesn't matter. what's his name? Randy Hutchinson, yeah. Yeah, I met with him, great visit. The company put me up at the nicest place I think I'd ever stayed at at the time, some fancy golf course that I didn't get to enjoy because we were in meetings all day long. But yeah. nonetheless, I remember that. And then not long after, I, I was on vacation at the beach and got a phone call from one of the leaders of the company that said, I'm out and it's, we're, we're, we're going down. So on that day though, did you immediately kick it into, okay, all good. Here's what we're going to do next. Or did you have a moment of calling your wife and saying, we, <laughs> we need to adjust the budget? <laughs> well, for me personally, it was really stressful because my wife worked there. My mother worked there. I didn't know that. Wow. That was a, a very personal experience to go through, but, um, yeah, I'll be honest, that was very reactionary. Like I, it was almost like a state of shock because it happened so fast, you know, it, it, that did happen. You know, it was like, you know, a few months back we were on the top of the world, you know, and it, it, it see, I remember, you know, having discussions with, you know, my, some of my friends that worked there at the time. I was like, we're never gonna have to look for another job again. You know, it's like, we, we really, there was a little bit of arrogance and I, I was a lot of companies during that time period. It was like, you, you, you didn't realize, especially given that I grew up in the industry, that you were more of a product of the market than you were of your own efforts. Not that there weren't a lot of smart people, but it was really easy to, if you were driven and entrepreneurial, you could have made a lot of money in mortgage pre-2007, right? You didn't have to necessarily be special. And, and uh, but I, was, I didn't really understand that until until I went through the experience at Caliber and really worked for Joe. I mean, I was really, I think to, to, to get to your, your question, I think what, what got me comfortable, you know, almost like addicted to change is I think the first few years at Caliber, I worked for 10 different CEOs. And so just think about the instability of that, like you're 
constantly having to re-justify your own existence and like rebuild those relationships and learn how to kind of you know work with the new style and, and well we know we know in this industry when when new ceos come in generally they bring their people to <laughs> yeah. fill so you're thinking who's coming in behind me right you're, you're qb1 but you might be qb2 really fast yeah, it was, it was very humbling, you know, and, and, and it, it did, it did, uh, it, I'll tell you this story, it's funny, um, hopefully Joe doesn't get mad, I remember the first time I met Joe, I was going to leave, there, long story short, it was really painful early on at Calvary, and, and, and uh, I was going to leave, and, and the head of HR is like, you need to stay and talk to this Joe Anderson guy, because he's going to come in, and he's going to help us, uh, you know, turn things around. And uh, so I'm like, okay, you know, I was one in a rush. I'll talk to him. And, and I remember the first time I, and it was kind of cool. Joe's, I mean, for those of you that don't know, I mean, Joe ran Consumer Lending and Countrywide. So the guy's right. like this incredible, like he's this name, right? He's, he's really, um, he knows his stuff and he's done big things. And so it was exciting to talk to him. No problem. Just talk to him. I sit down <laughs> And, uh, and I just go into my spiel about everything is wrong and everything I want to do, but can't do and blah, blah, blah. And I remember him saying, he says, man, you, you sure do have a lot of, pa-. he's just, oh, and you know, Joe's this Texas guy, right? So he's Texas accent. He's He'll like, tell you straight up. Yeah. yeah. He's like, you, he's like, you sure do have a lot of passion, man. I really like it, but you don't know shit about mortgage banking. <laughs> <laughs> That's very Joe Anderson for sure. <laughs> it's like, He's like, if you want to learn, he's like, oh, that's all right. He's like, I like you. I'll teach, you know. And and uh, I remember, like, as I don't, I think that's a right around. I just, I just realized I didn't know everything, you know. And like, there's, there was this period of time where I think a lot of people suffer from this, and some people, it destroyed them. They, they couldn't get over the success that they had pre 2007, and they equate, equated that with their efforts, and they weren't able to make the transition that, you know. A lot of it was market, you know, and the, and there's a whole other side to mortgage banking that's it's so sophisticated, especially when you start to understand, you know, what really drives the purchase market and the value of servicing and how all this works from an economic standpoint, all the way back to the, the you know the, the secondary market capital market side of it. It's it's just a really cool industry, man, and 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 despite how much I've learned and and the success I've had, I still have a lot to learn. There's so much so much left out there in mortgage because it's and I think there's it's only gonna get better because it's not staying the way it is it's it's dynamic it's evolving it's changing if you're mm-hmm. not thinking about that next step and where the industry's going you know um the industry will eat you up do you, I don't know if you know David Licken um David's got uh uh he, he he's been in the industry a long time he owned a couple of companies tech side mortgage bankers um, he has a podcast called Lickin on Lending. Great, okay. great guy and a yeah. voice for podcasting. Boy, he does a good job. But he, um, I was on his podcast. He was on mine also. And I can't remember which one it was, but he had a comment that you just, you just basically repeated. And it was you, something along the lines of your, your greatest enemy to growing your business is your current success. Absolutely. Yes, and, absolutely. And it was, it was, he said it, he said it better than that. Whatever he said was slicker than what I just said, but it was, you, you get the point. And I think that's basically what you're saying is that for those of us like you that embrace change and know that no matter what you do, it's coming. Well, then you, you do allow yourself to get out of your own way. Yeah. Some, right. And allow those things to happen, but maybe be a little bit more prepared because you're not so focused on your own short-term success. That's right. Well, and all a lot of it's too arrogance, right? It's like you you can't, you know. There's a there's a saying. It's like you, you know, celebrate wins, don't collect trophies. Right? Mm-hmm. Ever, ever heard that one? Like that's oh, yeah. wrong with being proud of what you've done and celebrating it. But man, don't put it on your you know, don't put it on your bookshelf as a trophy because it ain't gonna make you. It ain't gonna ensure your next win. <laughs> no kidding. And then it's public enemy that said, "Don't let a win get to your head or a loss to your heart." There you go. That's, That's another a good one as well. Little <laughs> PE. You didn't think I'd throw in some PE quotes, Thomas, did you? To the, to the walk podcast. <laughs> what is um what it what are the 
things that you're hearing the most from your business partners? To, I mean, now that you're getting on the road and I've seen you on LinkedIn and, and some other spots, taking some fantastic pictures with, with some of these partners of, of yours and HomePoint, what are the things that are on, that, that are top of mind for them right now? And, and, and I would assume that a lot of these people fall into that bucket that they do get caught up in their own success. And 2020 was insane, man. Like, like, you know, the mortgage industry, those are the people that shouldn't be complaining about not getting to go on a vacation for the last 18 <laughs> months or so, because they were making four or five X what they, what they've ever gotten used to making. So on the heels of that or still in the midst of the tail end of that, what are you hearing from, from your business partners? Oh, a lot. I mean, I, I think that, um, well, obviously there's the macro, uh, environment, you know, around, you know, um, what's going on and so at some point rates going to go up I, I think that's you know it will happen it's you know it's just a function of a win which is means if you're structured your business around refi that's a problem you know and and so I, I do I do think that you know what's been really nice being out in the in the field is um you know we have some really good partners that get it you know and you know I will say the common theme between the the ones that do is they're 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 focused on sustainability in, in and they're focused on probably a couple areas i'd say is one you know how do you really uh continue to control and captivate and plan your business around the purchase side because mm -hmm. if, if, if you look at the i think the one thing that is encouraging is you have you know COVID has caused all these short-term supply issues around the the purchase market and so you're you know seeing all this home price appreciation and and you know it's hyper competitive around you know people you know cash buyers and trying to get homes and whatnot that that is um is problematic now but if you look at the the why i mean yes some of it's the supply side and what's happened with COVID and the the time it's taken to build homes but you do have this massive pent-up demand on, on the on the buy side for purchase you have these generations that are now coming into into age that are that are ready to buy a home and some of that was because they were delayed you know you had you know, some of the generations were delayed they live with their parents maybe a little too long <laughs> so, right. you know you also have the dynamic of uh you know i don't think we're gonna ever go back to the office i mean we'll have some people that'll be back in the office but but you know home point is is i think a lot of companies in, in fact most companies are probably going to live in some state of remote work which is changing right dynamic of where people want to live you know and so you're going to see i guess what i'm saying is that i think you know you're going to see a pretty robust purchase market for the next three or four five years and so i think you know the partners that that i think are going to be successful are the ones that are really positioning to take advantage of that market but also recognizing that look the the cost of the cost to originate a loan are too high. They're just too high. Like they, they're going to come down. Um, and I think that that also is linked to the uh, recapture side of the equation. The, name one other industry that, that works so hard to originate another customer that pays, you know, upwards of $8,000 to gain that customer, but does on average, you know, 20% is the performance of the industry for retaining those cuts. It's horrible. Yeah. You no, know, and so I think that the the shift that you'll see is I do think that there's going to be more consolidation on the servicing side. I think the originators that that are sustainable are going to be the ones that that figure out a way to to not only captivate the purchase side of the business, but really build, you know, either through combinations of lenders like, you know, like HomePoint, right, or working with. Uh, you know, it's just not that I don't think, as you know, Eric, I'm a, I'm a wholesale guy. I'm, I'm highly focused because there's two ways to get physical distribution, right? You can, you can access the, the, you know, I think right now we estimate there's probably close to 15,000, you know, broker accounts out there. There's probably upwards of 50, 60,000 originators, if not 70,000 originators around the country that are, that are working for, you know, brokers. So it's a great way to get physical distribution because, as you know, I mean, physical distribution is important for purchase, right? You, right. you have to be one company that's that's figure out a way to drive purchase volume in a meaningful way, it, disproportionately as their volume, right? Without having originators local in market, not one company has been able to do it. Um, and so there's two ways to do it: you can do it through wholesale, or you can do it by you know by retail, where you you actually have the the originators work for your company and 
and it's not the, I, I chose wholesale because I think it's more efficient ways of lender to build scale, right? And I think the days of these very large scale retail companies are, are kind of problematic because they become very inflexible uh, and they, they start to become burdened with these cost structures that, that put them as, at a disadvantage to wholesale. And so I think where the market's gonna go are smaller companies that are focused on origination, right? If that's Nondell, if that's a small regional retail player that's full correspondent, if it's small broker, right? That So they're focused on originations. They do that really, really, really well. They're able to run their business in an entrepreneurial way. And then they're signed up with and backed with lenders that they have material scale because scale is really important. And I've really come to appreciate that with my experience at home point, just having scale and the benefit you get, you know, when it, when I, when you're doing a billion a month, right. Of, of volume as a lender versus if you're doing 10 billion a month, your, your cost is not that much different in terms of HR and right. IT and your infrastructure costs and the efficiencies that you get with that incremental volume are huge. And, and then you layer on top of that, the, the servicing side, it's, it's even bigger. And so, that's where I think it goes is I think you see, you see originations becomes really more, it breaks up into smaller players, right? That are nimble and, and more effective at being entrepreneurial. And then it's backed by scaled lenders, you know, that, that provide um, the cost benefit of scale and the efficiency of scale and the, the flexibility, right? In that scenario, these originators can choose to, to do business with whoever they want to do business with, right. you know? have options right, they can spread it out they can hedge a bit do, do you going sticking with the scale conversation and cost to originate do, do you get many questions or concerns about the gasoline that's been thrown on the technology fire that could fuel the conversation around the somewhat elimination of what the current originator looks like today right that if we're going to scale if we're going to create efficiencies if we're going to if we're going to decrease our cost to originate well then we're going to do it through technology and sticking young people in a cubicle with a headset on and or you know click button get mortgage whatever um, yeah. do, do you are those things you're still are you hearing more of that from your broker partners and i'm curious and how do you how do you how do you talk through that so there's a couple things to that. Well, one, let me give you the, I'll come back to the broker partner comments because I do, yeah, I have gotten a lot of insight into that. Um, but I, I do I do find it funny because I've actually, especially coming from it, you know, I was, I came into the industry on the technology side. And so my, my initial, you know, lens that I looked through for probably the first 10 years of my career was how do I automate people's job away? How do I make right. it? I wanted to create a box where a borrower could, or a vending machine, they go up to a vending machine, they could, you know, insert some coins, click a button and out would come a house and a loan, right? That was like, <laughs> and like, you've seen this, like, I've seen this cycle play out. What'll happen is refis come, refi, uh, the refi boom comes, people, you know, lenders make a lot of money. Cause that's, if you look at this industry money's made in between cycles, like that, that's what's, you know, very unique about mortgage, but they're also too busy to do anything innovative, right? And so then what happens is, but they start they start talking about how like they're, they're all going to change the world and you do all this innovative things. Then you get you get companies like you know Microsoft was one or Google or Amazon or you know they have all like hey we should come in and like really fix mortgage because it's really screwed up and it should be automated. It should be like people should go to a website and get a loan, that sort of thing. And right. you, if you've noticed over the last, I mean, I remember the first one was 2000, uh, actually 2000, remember Microsoft tried to come in and mm -hmm. then you go back five or six years ago, Amazon, Amazon was trying was to come in. in right? Yeah, and, and then they start to realize, oh my gosh, this is really freaking hard. You know, there's a, <laughs> I guess my point is a reason that you don't, you that hasn't happened, right? It's not like, it's not like the internet's a new thing at this point. <laughs> right. There's a reason, and, it, and I'll tell you what I believe it is. So one, so much of the market is dictated by the back end. And so you're, you're never going to be able to fundamentally change the way a loan is originated on the front end. It has to be done on the back end. It has to be done by Fannie, Freddie, the federal government, HUD. It has, that's the only way you're going to be able to do it. And so we, at this point, we're entirely limited, limited by their own uh, creativity. And then the second reason is I, I don't think, I mean, if you if you just think about what, what we're actually doing, we're putting borrowers in homes, 
We're keeping borrowers in homes. It's a very, this is where someone raises their family. It's a very personal thing. And I just don't ever see us, at least in my lifetime, getting to a world where a, a borrower or a, a person that wants to, to buy a home is going to feel comfortable doing that without human beings being involved in that. Mm-hmm. I just don't see it. I think you're going to still need some form. It might change. It's going to be automated. And this, this is the piece I think people have a hard time reconciling. Yes, technology is coming. Efficiency is, is a must. It needs to happen. Things need to get more efficient. But it doesn't need, mean you need to remove the people, right? It means what, and so like applying back to your comment, what I'm seeing and what I believe the future is on the origination side is I'm seeing a lot of really cool models pop up where, where, uh, people are trying to lever originators, right? And so it's not about originators making less. It's about levering them so they can make the same amount, if not more, because they're doing more loans. Like right. that's, and that's the piece that has, the reason why that hasn't changed is because there's a hyper fixation on how much comp you make per loan. <laughs> there's a hyper fiction on that you know and 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 if you it's funny if you look at all the cool stuff that has happened in like the last eight or nine years day one certainty all that there's been all these things that have happened that should have created efficiency on the origination side and brought down our cost to originate that haven't mm-hmm. why is that is because it's, it's structural right there's an organizational component to this it's structural and so what I'm seeing is, is, is companies are saying, look, we're going to redefine what the originator is and what they do. And, and we're going to make it more about adding value uh, in, in really driving the experience with the consumer and, and less about um, these little individual kind of entrepreneurs that, that, that sort of are siloed. Right. And because and, many times it's like the, you know, everyone has their assistants and they have their way of doing things and, and by the way, they've been successful for a reason. Their way works. But just because it worked last year, the year before, doesn't mean it's going to work. And so I think that, so, that, that, that companies will crack that. And, they, and the way you do that, by the way, is that smaller. Like you're seeing most of the innovations going to occur with the small brokers, non-Dell shops, smaller regional players. Reason for that is because they're able to be more nimble in how mm-hmm. they and how they think about the business. And by the way, and you know this, it's a highly personal thing. If you're going to go to an originator, a top originator, and say, I'm going to change the way you work, and I'm going to lever you up, so you're going to make more money, but I'm going to pay you less per loan, there's a lot of trust that needs to come with that. And that's going to take a lot of energy by owners and people that really understand their business to to, to work people through it, you know? And, and so I think that's what I'm seeing, is there's a lot of really cool ideas out there on how to not take the people out of it, not reduce people's overall annual compensation. It's like, hey, man, like, let's have you make the same amount. But here's how we got to collectively work together to, to create efficiencies, because if we don't, we're dinosaurs and we're going to die. We're going to yeah. die. Yeah. You know, um, I, I've been working with somebody here recently. It's about a two hundred and twenty five million dollar originator. With, with a with a depository, but a small depository, pretty entrepreneurial, flexible, allows him to be nimble. He's not unhappy where he yeah. is, um, but his comment to me was, "I would love for somebody to show me how to scale me." Yeah, and I knew what he meant, right? Because and his point is not, "Don't tell me I can hire four more LOAs." That's not what I'm saying. How, how can I scale me in creative and efficient in, in, in efficient ways that maybe involve better leadership, better, better, um, better thought from leadership, also better technology and efficiencies that are that, that relate to those. But and then I also think about, look, I'm not a this is just me talking. I'm, I'm not a brokers or better guy. I'm also not a bankers or better guy. You, you, you know how Drew and I have always worked, which is I don't know anything until I know what's important to you. And until I know what's important to you and what your goals are and what you think is working and what isn't working, we have to go through that analysis before I can tell you what I think might be some suggestions that could create some value, right? But one thing I have noticed is that the large independent mortgage bankers retail that one of the things they do struggle with, and especially the most entrepreneurial ones, are that their risk is if they attempt to make a change that could actually be really, really good for the street, the street's going to come to them and say, I didn't ask for that. 
Right. That wasn't my idea. And so to your point, I can understand at some level how the how the broker doesn't really come into the conversation with that same no. feeling of ownership. I mean, they already own their business, but they can choose to work with you or not. That's right. And that's kind of my point. It's like, it's not about, because I'm with you, man. I mean, I, I spent years growing retail. I, st- I know some really good people that are awesome originators, awesome people, highly successful, and will always be successful on the retail side. I, I, it's To me, it's not about that. It's what, what's going to support the innovation and the change. And I will say from a lender perspective, if I, if I approach that side first, in wholesale as a lender, I have no choice but to be better every day because if I'm not better every day, I don't get loans. Like people right. don't give me loans. And so it forces like this rapid innovative mindset on the lending side because you literally have no choice. It's feast or famine, you know, die or live kind of, you know, live or die kind of thing versus on the, on and then, so that's the lending side. If you look at the origination side, the issue is, 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 is really more about just how do you actually navigate people through it and i think you're, what you're raising is very true i, I saw it's like you these large scale retail platforms again i'm not saying they're bad i'm just saying i don't think that's where you're going to find the innovation and the reason why is there's so much risk if you change something and you're wrong your ability to kind of manage people through it and communicate it and, and the downside risk you have of being wrong it incents you to stay the same. <laughs> yeah, you could lo- you could lose thirty percent of your sales, your origination yeah, overnight. Yeah. Like, why change? Like why? Yeah, change? It's tough. You know, and I that was you know I don't want to talk about my past too much there, but that was part of the the, the issue I struggle with in my prior role, and and so versus if you're small and and it just comes back to the people side, and and you know because we've we've had a lot of change here at Home Point, and I can tell you the hardest part about it is communicating with people, getting them to see the bigger picture, getting them comfortable with it. And it's much easier to do that when when you have direct personal relationships with someone versus when you do this kind of large scale behemoth where people are just numbers. Like it's it's just the reality. Like, it's, you know what I mean? It's not good or bad or like one thing's like, I'm not making a judgment on that. I'm just saying it's a lot easier to innovate in a third party model than it is in a large scale distributed retail model. Well, and you're, and look, you're playing your game and you're a fan of your game and you've been really good and really successful with, with what you've done and you've proven concepts. So it, for those that you support, it would be hard to argue what you just said. I think one of the things I love about this industry is that human beings are not linear <laughs> to, no. for, you know, to, to say it lightly. And, and what's important to one person is not necessarily important to others. Some people want to be involved in a large organization because they feel like it, de- it, de- it decreases their risk at some level. And maybe they're not chasing the same reward that others are chasing. And the, much like a consumer, you know, a consumer has a tremendous amount of options when they look to secure a loan. Um, and, and sometimes those options really boil down to sometimes it's a, some, simply a commodity. Where, where am I going to get the best price? And other times it's who's the person I trust the most. And then sometimes it's somewhere in between. And I think that's one of the things that we've always loved the most about this space. And also, you know, leaders like you, I'm, I'm going to be sensitive to time and, and, and cut us here in just a minute. And, and when we, when we, when we stop the record button, don't go anywhere. So you and I can catch up for a minute <laughs> offline. Um, anything you want to get off your chest though, before we break anything top of, and it doesn't have to be mortgage related. What are you doing outside of the industry to keep yourself busy and motivated? What what gives you juice outside of mortgage banking? You know, it's my uh, these days. It's my family. I really, I really enjoy uh, just hanging out, barbecuing on the weekends, and uh, you know, not being on an airplane. That's, that's, yeah, that's been, we are building a house, which has been you know, contrary to a lot of feedback. I've always told it's a horrible experience. I think maybe we just pick the right builder, but that's been a lot of fun. To be honest. I think you've probably also been married to your wife long enough now to where you, you both know where to back off of each other. Right. Um, like, let's be clear. She's entirely in charge. <laughs> well, then that's why you're doing fine. I'm along, I'm along for this ride, man. There is no, it's what she is. She's the boss on that one, but no, this has been great. I really enjoyed it and uh, would love to love to do it again one of these days Eric. hey let's do it again if there's a topic you ever want to knock around I'm, I'm always here to to do that maybe maybe next time we can figure out a way to to do it in person and and look man until then phil shoemaker home point thanks for hanging out uh with us on the walk we appreciate it bud my pleasure appreciate it